everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this first uh, live Cradle Club Fireside Chat. And this has been a, um, a lot coming to this day and we're so excited to share this with all of you. Um, so first, before we get started, I'm gonna have Peaceflo kind of give us a, a little introduction and say a couple things. Thanks so much, Maria. Um, this is a long time coming. We've been doing Credo in the summer for 22 summers, but we haven't done it through the year. And uh, everybody said, you know, Credo is not a summer program, it's a way of life. And so here's our chance to prove it. Um, really excited about this thing called Credo Club, which um, some of you know about, some of you need to figure out a little bit more about. But basically, it's a bunch of, of teaching videos, a bunch of inspirational videos. We have uh, Morning Sing is no longer Morning Sing because you can watch it whenever. That's called a Whatever Is series. So once a month, we're going to be sending you a Whatever Is series. And uh, we're going to be doing some uh, technique videos and some uh, listening corner. For, for Right now, I'm monopolizing the listening corner because I want to put a lot of viewers on before people get a chance to put other people on. Um, and then... Uh, Basically, Credo Club is going to become your place to hang out, and uh, we're going to open up to you and some of these great people like you see on the screen tonight. Um, so this is our first social event of, of Credo Club, and we're delighted to, you know, firesides have always been a really important part of Credo and a great way for us to, to get to know um, some really great musicians and really, really cool people on a more 3D basis. So I'm delighted that you're all here. Um, keep an eye out for Credo Club um, announcements and stuff like that. We want to do some service projects together. We want to have other kinds of hangouts. But we started, uh, you know, just like your teachers. I think you can stretch right at first. And one week after we announced the thing, and we, we have you all here. And we weren't sure that we were going to get, you know, a modicum of people here, but here we are. So that encourages us to do more next month. And we'll do, keep doing more each month until you have way too much of us. So um, that's really what I wanted to say. If you aren't already registered for Credo Club, you can go to the Credo channel, uh, Credo um, webpage, and sign up for Credo Club or Google you know, Credo Club, Credo, and, and sign up. So you'll get notifications about this kind of stuff and you'll get all the cool passwords and secret handshakes and all that kind of stuff. Um, for Violas, you'll get to learn third position. It'll be really, really awesome. Uh, so uh, so uh, without further ado, we'll have kickoff. I'll ask our Cleveland Orchestra members questions and um, they'll talk about their you know, journeys of going from students to being in a professional orchestra and how their faith um, is involved with that. And uh, throughout the chat, if you guys have any questions, you can type it in the chat on the side um, and near the end, we'll have 10, 15 minutes or so, um, and I'll ask them those questions. So, but, uh, so we're just going to start off. Um, if each of you could just introduce yourselves and say your instrument and um, kind of a quick little background. Score order, please. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll start with Miss Lynn. Hi. So I know my name says Ken Rock, and um, my husband must have signed me out of my account. And <laughs> I was like, what? I took an educated guess. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Jessica Lee, and um, I'm the assistant concertmaster of the Cleveland Orchestra. Um, but, you know, much like all of you are experiencing your own journeys um, through life um, and as musicians, um, I've had quite a, an interesting journey to where I am now and I look forward to where my journey takes me from here. Um, I was born in Richmond, Virginia and it's so funny because um, I really, I, I, I think I was two and I saw one of my older friends um, she was five or six or something and she had just gotten a violin and I just really something about it captivated me and I, I just wanted to have it but you know um, somehow uh, her grandmother uh, just really aggressively got in there and said you are not allowed to touch this and she locked me in the bathroom every time the violin came out so you know if any of oh you goodness. have little <laughs> nieces or nephews you know, who are about that age, you know, the best way to get them to want something is to do that. So I begged my mom for about six months to get me a violin. It was every day. 
and she got me one when I turned three. And I really, I do think that um, from the day you're born, um, God, and from the moment you're conceived, really, God has a plan for each and every person. And I believe that um, that's, you know, you are all here because God has, um, has that plan for you, that he wants you to um, glorify him through music and through what you can do through your gifts. And in that same way, I do feel like, you know, from that very first moment, he was calling me to music. And um, so, you know, I grew up in Virginia, just I played, I took lessons. And, um, um, and then uh, when I was about 14 years old, um, some teachers encouraged me to audition for Curtis um, Institute in Philly. And um, I, I really had no idea what that meant at that point. Um, so I was like, sure, I'll go play. And um, he led me there. And it's amazing to see, like, that was my first real dive into, you know, the, the real, like, straight path towards being a professional musician. Um, and it's just amazing all the people that God placed in my life. Even before I went there, the teachers I met, the mentors, the, the colleagues, the friends that I made um, all throughout um, my childhood and through school. And, and um, you know, he places everybody around each other for a reason. And I've, I've always, I see that more and more as I um, make my journey through music that um, that everybody meets for a reason and every, everything happens for a reason. He, um, even, uh, especially the d challenging times, I think. I think every single challenging time I've had where, you know, and it hasn't been, you know, all roses. I remember when I was uh, going to uh, graduate from Curtis and graduate from Juilliard after that, I, I had serious doubts. I was, I was studying for the LSATs, I said, I don't know if I want to do this. Um, and that's okay, because I feel like it's been the challenging times that have really brought me to my knees before him and asked him um, to show, like, to, to just be humble, just be humble before him and say, show me what you want to do with this. And um, I, I feel like, um, you know, what I want to, you know, just, I know we're going to get into more things, but the, one of the biggest lessons I've learned that I would like to share with you all is that um, no matter what happens, God is right there. And especially in the hard times, you know, he just, he brings you closer to him through that. And I, I think it, it really, um, it's always made my music making um, better and more complete because of it. Thank you, that's awesome, that's wonderful. Um, all right, Mr. Knopka. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? There we go. I was laughing. <laughs> I was laughing be before because of Josh. Is it Wit? His his uh, his image there. I want that. My son, if you can see that down there, my son would really appreciate you. Six notes or five notes for top forty music. That's incredible. Oh. Um, Anyway, I'm Stan Kanapka. I'm assistant principal viola in the Cleveland Orchestra. And I've been in the orchestra since 1991. I was actually hired as a section player at first. And then I had my assistant audition two years later. And, um, and then two years after that, I joined the faculty at the Cleveland Institute of Music. And um, before that, I went to the Cleveland Institute of, uh, of Music. I studied with Robert Vernon, who was at that time the principal viola. Of the orchestra. Going backwards, I went to Interlochen Arts Academy for three years, studied with David Holland, and before that I just pretty much grew up in the Chicago area. In fact, I'm from mostly from Elmhurst, Illinois, which is Mr. Slowick's hometown, and uh, which is a pretty cool um, providence there. Um, yeah, I, I um, try to think where to start. I definitely would say that my relationship with God and my musical life have been um, tied together from the very outset. Um, anyone that's at the previous fireside chat is going to hear some of these similar things, but uh, I was about nine years old 
And uh, my parents got divorced when I was nine. I was the oldest of four kids. So it's hard to explain everything that went on there, but I ended up kind of babysitting my little, my siblings every single day for many hours every day at nine. And it was just, uh, you know, it's not about blame, but it just ended up that way. Well, at that time, I also moved to a very, very uh, uh, kind of dangerous part of Chicago. And in school, there were fights all the time. That was really kind of like a wild kingdom. So uh, right, right away, my first day in, in class, at, I think I was in fifth grade, fourth or fifth grade, the toughest kid in the class came up and, and my very first day and challenged me to a fight and said, I'm the toughest guy in the class. And if you have ever have a problem with that, you and I can meet in the parking lot. And uh, from that point on, uh, he teased me and his buddies. I was basically bullied that entire year. So we moved there. I had the divorce. Um, and it was probably the worst year of my life except for one thing, which is that in all of that despair, I had a children's Bible. And I had this equation in my head, which said, if I read this book, maybe I'll get faith. So I opened up this children's Bible and began to read it every night. And uh, f from that point on, I was given three major gifts which you would never ask for as a nine-year-old. I mean, you wouldn't know to ask for it. First, I was given the ability to see. Reading the scriptures lifted me up above that entire situation and allowed me from 10,000 feet to see everything. My parents, my situation, my role in, in the world, all of this, the school situation, the friends and the neighborhood from a divine vantage point. Um, that was really a testimony to me that there was something special about the message in this book that I was getting. Of course, along with reading the scriptures, I began to pray. Um, the next thing that happened is uh, I joined a boxing club. So I was given the ability to see, I was given the ability to defend myself. And there's a whole story behind that. And I ended up fighting that kid in the classroom that challenged me because he and his buddies. And uh, to give you a little idea, the, the, the teacher, when we started to fight in the classroom, she and all the students moved all the desks and chairs out of the way to give us room. That's the culture. It wasn't to stop the fight. It was to let these boys get it out, right? Which maybe was smart. I don't know. But from that point on, everything changed in my social life. Um, so, and then the third thing is I was handed a violin. I wanted to play drums. There was no space. I said, well, Claire, and that was like the other instrument I knew about. And there's some girl wanted the, wanted to play that. It was only one space for that. And the string player handed me a fiddle. I said, try, let me see your fingers. Can you do that? There's some silly test. And I didn't even care. But from that point on, so now I had the ability to see, the ability to defend myself, and then the ability to express myself, which was exactly what I needed. And as I was reading the scriptures every night, my faith, of course, uh, did exactly what I thought, which is it would grow. And that relationship was tied to my music directly. Um, in the sense that even at 9, 10, and 11 years old, I saw something transcendent in music. Beauty was something that was beyond the mere physical, even social. And the truth of the scripture was transcendent. So that was also beyond what I could just deduce or conclude by what I've learned from my experiences. So, um, and then of course the morality that you get the standard. So you've got goodness, truth, and beauty. So I discovered those three transcendentals at around nine and 10 years old, because I could never express it that way. I look back and, and I realized that as I was praying, God gave me three profound truths, profound uh, experiences that brought me outside of my own life. And music was a key piece. 
I had no idea I'd become a professional musician. Um, but uh, anyway, all of this, there's many, many other pieces to the story of how I got into music. We had very little money. Um, my grandfather, the only person in my family that had money, had money because he was in the mafia. <laughs> and uh, I had heard the Chicago Symphony performance when I was 13. I went back and happened to visit my grandfather. And you know, if any, you know what the mafia is, it's a criminal organization. That's how you made money by uh, racketeering in the unions in Chicago. And uh, he's, so you heard the Chicago Symphony. I said, Grandpa, it's unbelievable. I was so moved by that performance. In fact, I was so moved, and this is not an exaggeration, I walked out of Orchestra Hall, which it was called at the time, out on the Michigan Avenue, which is a major street in Chicago, and just imagine hundreds of people flowing out of Orchestra Hall after a concert, just rushing to get to their cars, and there's a 13-year-old on his knees bawling his eyes out because he wanted to do and participate in what he just witnessed. So at 13, God had already grabbed me, like Jessica, there's a plan. This He had already locked me into something that he knew he wanted me to be a part of. So uh, I told my grandpa about this. He says, you love the Chicago Symphony. I said, grandpa, is, you know, they've, he's, they've won more Grammys than anybody, and I think that's still true. Um, and it went on about the performance and how it inspired me, and how it just it was mind blowing to me. He says, you want to be in the Chicago Symphony? I said, Grandpa, that would be a dream. And then he said, would you like for me to create an opportunity? Well, in the language of the mafia, that meant there would be some Chicago's poor Chicago Symphony violas floating in the Chicago River and a 13 year old showing up on stage no one under no one knowing why except the personnel manager and the uh anyway of course that did not happen but what did happen is he funded uh and enabled me to go to a place that otherwise i would never have been able to afford which was interlochen national music camp and that was an explosion of musicians my age you know it wasn't this horrible neighborhood it was a bunch of kids that loved to do like you guys Love to be in music, love to learn music, love to play music with each other. And it was uh, an incredible grace beyond words. That led me to go to Interlochen Arts Academy. And, uh, and that kind of connects me up to, to Cleveland. Um, so I think I'll stop there. But that's the background story. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm learning so many... I've been, you know, for those of you who don't know, I'm from Cleveland and I, uh, I know a lot of the orchestra members through various, whether it's festivals or personal connections, like Miss Lee is my teacher at the end of my master's. So, but I'm, this is so exciting getting to know so much about all of you. It's wonderful. And then our, our cello now. Yeah, my name's Alan Harrell and yeah, I'm like you, Maria. I, whenever I do these, I learn more about my colleagues, which is amazing. Um, and Stan, I'm glad you didn't play cello when your dad was, or grandfather was in the Cleveland Mafia. That would have, uh, um, that would have been interesting to say the least. Um, so anyway, my story um, is similar to Jessica in that I'm, I'm from the South. I, I grew up in South Carolina. And, um, it's, but it's different for her in that I started pretty late. I was started in the public school program. I started in fifth grade. And so uh, my brother, who was older, um, he, he played cello also in public school. And so we had an instrument and um, around the house and I, I liked it and I liked the sound of it. And I decided I wanted to play. And so um, um, Peter, I've never told you this, but whenever I went to the, you know, the first day when they tell you, you know, you get to pick your instrument basically. And I wasn't the, um, I was vertically challenged, I'll put it that way. Um, and so like, you know, they were like, they were heavy on the viola. They were pushing the viola and I, I held my ground and I was like, no, I, it, the cello might be bigger than me, but I want to play the cello and I'm still playing it today. Um, and so like, I, I, I'm just trying to think of where to start. Um, you know, I'm, I was blessed in that I grew up in a family 
that um, was was where Christian Christianity was very important to them to everybody, and it really came from my grandmother um, on my dad's side um, when she was I don't know how old she was, but in the Second World War, um, my grandfather um, he was a captain of an oil tanker, and um, they were torpedoed. Um, his ship was torpedoed by the the Germans, and it sank. And so so all of a sudden. She um, was, um, you know, a widow, and she was raising two kids, and so she had to live um, in, in a mill, and so like, you know, she was very, very poor. Um, my um, on my mother's side, um, you know, they were um, tobacco and cotton farmers, um, and you know, I talked to them about, you know, what it was like, um, you know, for their family because they had eight kids, and they were like Southern Georgia tobacco farming and cotton farming. But, and you would have been hard pressed to find anybody of any race at that time who was poorer than them. And so they worked so hard, both sides of my family worked so hard so that my parents could then get, um, my mom was a teacher and my dad taught her an automotive plant so that they would, and they worked hard to give me the opportunity to do this crazy thing like music. Neither of them were musicians. So like whenever I started getting serious with it, like in middle school, I was, you know, I was a late bloomer in that sense. I was in like um, seventh, eighth grade and I started going to the camps and things like Stan um, did. And, um, and I loved it. You know, I knew I came, I remember I went to Brevard Music Center and I came back and um, I told my parents, you know, I, I, I was like, I don't think I really want to do this for a living. And, you know, not being musicians, and I don't blame them for this, but like not being musicians, they were like, well, you know, you, you might want to think about, you might, might want to rethink that idea. Um, and so like, I, I kept practicing, I kept kept going um, um, with, with, with all my work and going, kept going to festivals, kept doing all states and competitions and things like that. And um, when I went to college, I went to the University of Alabama for undergraduate. Um, and so I was, um, in a weird space because I knew I wanted to do music, but I was also good at like um, science and math kind of things like a lot of musicians like you all are. Um, and so I was torn because, you know, I could either go into music with a very, very uncertain career um, or I could go into something like science or, or I was good at chemistry. So I, was, I was started as double majoring in chemistry. Um, and so like I did that for a little bit and at some point, you know, I had to sort of make a decision. I was like, I'm going to go for, um, go for it um, and, and just try this music. And if, if it doesn't work out, then, you know, I'll, I'll have at least tried it. And so that's where, where I was. And, you know, I'm still playing. Um, my um, brother, um, he, 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 he didn't play cello after high school, but he went into chemistry and like he's lost his job a couple of times just because of the economy and, you know, different things happen. So it just worked out in, in an amazing way. And like um, um, my colleague said, you know, you could see, sort of see God in all the details that sort of led me to Cleveland. I went to Cleveland Institute for Masters. I was away um, in Virginia Symphony for a year and then won a job in, in the Cleveland Orchestra and I've been here ever since. And so you, I can sort of see, looking back, it's very easy to see, um, but I can look back and see how God led me through all those little decisions that turn into a destiny um, along the way. And you can sort of see that when you're in the weeds, when, when you're you know, a, a teenager and you're in high school or even in college, you know, it's very difficult to, to see what's what's out there um I, you know that verse in the bible um it's um god's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path if you've ever been in the dark and you hold out a lamp in front of you you can only see like a step or two in front of you you can't see it's not like a, a airplane landing thing you know you're, you're only seeing like a step or two and that's all God will give you. And so you have to have faith that you're going the way that, that he wants you to go. And so I, I can see that looking back, but in the middle of it, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, as far as my relationship with God, um, I, like I said, I was blessed to come from a Christian family. And so that grandmother that whose, whose um, husband died, she, um, like I said, was very poor, but she was one of those people who you you could ask her if she needed anything. She didn't live in a big house. She had very little. But you ask her if she needed anything, and she would say, "No, I'm I'm fine." She had a contentment. She had something within her 
that, that um, was bigger than any material things. It was bigger than um, uh, anything else, and I knew I wanted that. And so she passed that on to my family and, and passed that love of God to, to me. And so I was blessed in that way to sort of um, have that Christian heritage and, uh, and make it a part of my life. And it's been so important. And I would agree with what Jessica said that you learn more in the hard stuff than you do when things are going well. You know, when, when you win a competition or you win a job, um, you know, it's, it's, there's no problem having faith at that point. But when bad things happen, you know, when, when, when you don't win the audition, when you don't get into the school that you think you're supposed to be at, or, um, you know, any number of things, you have, you know, you have somewhere to turn. And so, so that, is so important and you learn more it's, it's, i was um i was actually just doing a workout you know and, and when you're when you're working out you're 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 pushing your muscles right and, and so like the more resistance you have the stronger you get it's the same spiritually the more resistance the more um difficulty you go through again as, as hard as it is in the short term that's how you grow spiritually and so that's been my experience um and I guess we'll leave it at that and see what questions we have. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your witnesses. This is really inspiring and so great to hear. Um, so some of the first, one of the first questions we have um, just is what was, um, what was it like your audition experience? You know, what was it like going through school um, leading up to you being in the, in the, you know, either if it was a professional orchestra before the Cleveland orchestra or the Cleveland orchestra, um, Pretty much just your, you know, how you came to audition there and in that process and that journey. What, what, because um, everyone's process is different. Um, so just curious, you know, what that process looked like for the three of you. Um, I guess I'll start since I went first last time. But um, my path to being where I am today was kind of um, unexpected. Um, after I graduated school, I lived in New York for a long time. Um, I won uh, a big competition that got me management. Um, and I played in a, a string quartet that would tour twice a year for, I played in that quartet for about nine years. And, you know, I was doing a lot of um, kind of fun, exciting things in New York. I was a part of the Chamber of Music Society of Lincoln Center, and I was traveling almost every week. Um, I was on a plane, you know, every week to go play somewhere else at another festival or another concert series, and um, it was really exciting. I, I won't lie. It was great. I, I was having the time of my life, and, um, you know, taking auditions never even occurred to me. Um, and um, the interesting thing about that was um, even though I was doing all these really amazing fun things, something about where I was in my life um, and with God was, um, didn't, wasn't centered and wasn't grounded. And especially in that kind of high profile, fast paced kind of life as a musician, it's so easy to just get caught up in, you know, making what you're doing as a musician, your identity. And um, it, it, that's what happened. You know, I found myself being pulled into that. And um, even I, 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 much like Alan, I had, a, I have a grandmother she was like our matriarch who, who pulled the entire family into Christianity. Actually, my great grandfather was the person who opened the first seminary in Korea. And, um, and it, through him, my grandmother, just like my whole family is just like, that's what you do. You're, you're a Christian and God is the center of your life. And even with that grounding and being brought up into that, it's so easy to take things of this world and make them your identity. And that's what happened. Um, I felt myself falling into that. And so, you know, when things would be great, you'd feel so good about yourself. You'd feel like, this is awesome and I'm doing good. I'm, you know, I'm on top of the world. And then when things started to feel like they're slipping away, then you're, you go down with it. Um, and it, 
I look back now and, you know, God brought a lot of um, challenges into my life um, to bring me closer to him. So that now I, you know, when I feel myself starting to go in that direction, I can catch myself. And I'm like, I need to pray more. I need to, I need to, I need to, I need to be right with God. That's the only person I need to be right with. Everything else is just what he brings, you know, and the ways that he wants me to work for him. And so, um, um, but what happened was that um, I was going along doing my thing. I, I think I must have done that for like 10, 12 years. And then, um, we, uh, I, my husband and I, we found out we were having a baby. And, you know, at that time I was hopping on a plane every weekend. And then when I was at home, I'd be driving an hour and a half to Vassar College to teach long days and driving back an hour and a half that same day. And it was tiring. It was really tiring. And we finally had to have a talk like, is this really okay? Is this the way I want to be a parent? Um, and um, we realized that no, that's, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, that's not the way I wanted to live my life with my family. And so it just so happened that my very good friend who was in the Cleveland Orchestra already, she had been telling me about auditions for the past several years. And uh, I remembered that. And so I texted her, I said, hey, is, is that position still open? And she said, yeah, it is. And that the audition's in like three months. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll give it a shot. And so um, I, you know, I looked at the list. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to learn all these things. And so I just, you know, I, I was like, okay, God, let's see. Okay. This is, is, is this what you want? Let's, let's see, let's give it a shot. And and um, that was what he wanted for me. And, um, and you know, the audition process was really interesting because I didn't have any prior um, experience or kind of things to, you know, kind of scare me about it. I just said, all right, well, we'll see what happens. And um, he really, uh, just bringing me here, I just see, you know, the way he's, um, just it, it was it was all right there I, I it felt like just like Alan was saying like when you're in it you're like what is going on like I don't know <laughs> like, where are you leading me God really seriously tell me show me something but um, what I've learned from all these experiences is that even even when you don't feel like he's there or that he's not showing you anything um, that's actually when you have the chance to have the most intimacy with him because you're like, you know, I'm going to follow you even though I don't know anything because I trust you and I know you love me. And um, it's in those kinds of letting go moments that I feel like I've really um, deepened my relationship with him and that I've, um, that he's become more personal to me and that that I can also show him that I love him because I'm like, no matter what, I'm with you and I'm gonna do, you know, um, whatever you, I'm going to do whatever you bring to me. Um, and since then it's been like, it's been interesting just starting a new kind of job and um, having a different kind of lifestyle. And um, it's, you know, you know, um, just, in doing that and having to change your life so drastically, there's, there's been many moments where I'm like, God, what, what are you doing? You know? And, um, and it, you know, in, in this pandemic too, um, when things just stopped all of a sudden, I remember there was a moment um, for me early on in the pandemic, late April, May, when it just felt like, I mean, of course, just, one's own life and everything going on in the, in the in the world is just so uncertain and you don't know what's going to happen and then there's so much anxiety so much unknown and then of course your life as a musician you don't know you know what am i like i'm sure for you what's going to happen with school what are are there going to be auditions you know 
Um, and for, you know, for us, like, is there going to be work? You know, how are we going to, how are we going to get through this? And um, it's, it's so funny that that dark moment, th th those couple, I remember it was a couple of weeks. It was pretty, I was in a bad place. I didn't know, like I could feel it and my whole family could feel it. It just didn't, I wasn't in a good place. Um, and it was that, that really brought me, I remember just to my knees, I'm like, God, okay, I'm with you. I, I'm going to trust you. And I know that um, whatever happens with my life, you've got me. And um, my identity isn't in, you know, whether I, <laughs> whether I have a job, whether I even have a house, my, you know, all of that, even those horrible things, you know, um, my identity is in you. And that was a transforming moment for me. And um, I feel like, I think as Christians in our journeys through life, with anything that's in our lives, I think we go, we need those moments, not just once, not just twice, but regularly where we're like, wait a second, you're my identity, that, that's it. That, and that's all I need. And that gives us the peace and the security and the confidence to do, to be humble and also be bold where we need to be. So that's, yeah. Pass it on. That's wonderful. Oh, this is so great. Yeah, we'll pass it on to our down the score again. Is that me? I think that's you. Okay. <laughs> Just a piggyback on something Jessica said, because it's something I've learned um, was before the pandemic, but um, it was one of the most important things I think I've, I've one of one of the most important things I've learned in my faith walk my whole life. And it's this one thing that at first you're going to say, oh, that doesn't sound right. But I think you'll find it is right, which is that God does not need you. doesn't need you you exist because he loved you into existence you exist because he wants you to exist right now <laughs> he's creating you at this moment because in, 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 if he suddenly stopped willing you you would stop existing so you exist purely out of his mercy and love realizing that and this joins up with a few things Jessica said which is it's in those places in my life or in your life when you feel like you have zero control there's something you can't control in your life there's something that's that is is just out of control that's like the most sacred place there is in your life because it's the one place in your life that you actually understand things correctly the truth is you don't have control of anything you just think you do and so God gives you these places in your life where you don't have control, and that's his little portal that he gives you to himself. The truth is you don't have control of the next minute. So I have a different view now of like this pandemic situation or the job situation, because this is actually, I'm more in touch with the reality about my, my existence, about God's role, his grace, his destiny for me, all of that in this place where I have little control. So anyway, that just spurred that that on, Jessica. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, my story about getting into the orchestra, um, I can tie it back to that 13-year-old experience of, of knowing really then this really what I wanted to do uh, was to be an orchestral player. And um, from that point on, I just listened to orchestral recordings. I compared orchestras, and I listened specifically to viola sections after I switched to viola. And so that was my, my a kind of a litmus test for me of what the level of the orchestra is. Well, how did the viola section handle such and such passage? Music for strings, percussion, chalas, this or this excerpt, how'd they handle it? And so um, I went to uh, eventually... Uh, went to Cleveland. There's a story on that I could tell, but I'll I'll skip it. And uh, I walked into my very first lesson with Robert Vernon. I had, didn't really know who he was. I had just heard from people that he was like the 
kind of the god of, of orchestral auditions and so many of his students have won big, big jobs. And I'd never, I didn't, couldn't even recognize him in the hallway. I only knew it because I had the right room number. Showed up for my lesson. I walked out uh, knowing with 100% certainty that this was a god thing. It was a customized teacher for me. It was exactly what I needed. And that to this day is the truth. Um, I look back on the five, five years with him. Um, there was a point where someone in the Cleveland Orchestra had gotten sick, unfortunately. I think it was very serious lung cancer and, and he had retired. And Lynn Ramsey, who is currently uh, in the second chair of viola in the orchestra, has been for whatever, 30 years, was just was just hired to get into the orchestra. But she was stuck in her contract at St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. I kind of knew about that. In one lesson, Mr. Vernon said to me, Stanley, would you, and it sounds that actually echoes my grandfather. He's like, I, 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 you might have an opportunity that you may not want to miss. And it was like, it was this echoing. It's like, and, uh, and I was like, what is it? He goes, well, would you like to play as a substitute musician, violist with the orchestra? I think I was a junior. Of course, I knew deep down that this was the most important. I had just played a junior recital and 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 all these string quartet recitals and all these big deal concerto competition. I played Bartok with the orchestra, blah, blah, blah. I knew this was about a thousand times more important than anything I'd ever done. And so I said, well, absolutely 100,000%. And I mean, I just went crazy. I just practiced every except for one day a week i made sure my sundays were off sundays the day before my lesson by the way so it took a little guts to to commit to that but boy was it worth it because i was always fresh and i'd great uh, work great for lessons but i worked as hard as i could ever work i could have ever uh, uh, can't imagine working harder to be honest to the point that about five days before that substitute audition i started to lose my ability to play the viola I was missing all my shifts. I couldn't play my passage work anymore. My intonation went out the door. And talk about saying, God, what, what is up? I've given, I've put myself on the cross for this thing. And now you're taking it all away. And I knew this, you know, the audition was in three days and I was like gonna bomb it in front of Christoph von Dachnani. And, and these, you know, Yak Yao Ling and all these well-known conductors and this committee. So the day came and I realized this is total, by the way, Jessica, was the, the idea of being out of control. I walk on stage thinking, well, I'm about to, anything could happen here. And I said, Lord, all I know is I'm going to make this offering. I have no idea what's going to happen, but whatever it is, it's going to be from my heart to you. Well, that was... It, by God's grace, is the great, best audition I ever played. It was my first audition. I never played a better audition, even when I auditioned for the actual section position or assistant. Bob Vernon at that time was not quite a Christian. I think he was in transition with his wife. And, and he said words to me after that. Uh, I hope I'm not tooting my own horn here, but he's, he came up to me and he just said, Stanley, you filled the hall with glory. Well, those are not words that Robert Vernon would use if he knew him back in 1987. Um, and of course, I just, you know, cried. I don't think I could have played, played better. It afforded me that week. It was a weak position as substitute player. Little did I know that Lynn was not able to get out of her contract for almost eight more months. So I played in the era when we were recording every weekend. So I recorded all these Beethoven symphonies. I recorded all this stuff. It was an absolute dream come true. I was so poor. One paycheck changed my entire year financially. And then I was blessed with eight months of Big Five Orchestra income, which was an absolute grace and gift, which I needed because I didn't know how I was paying my tuition, the little tuition I had 
it took care of that. <laughs> it took care of a few things. I actually had a, a stereo system I bought, I think. That was it. Anyway, I knew that those eight months was really my true audition for the Cleveland Orchestra because I got to sit with everybody. I got to know everybody, everyone. was, And it was really a, a chance to learn that job. I was blown away the first day sitting in the string section and realizing that the conductor was giving data but the strings were doing things that were far beyond the data the conductor was giving so i was like okay how am i supposed to know and predict what to do so i just laid low sunk into the sound i mean the way they did dotted rhythms the way they would do articulations the way they would time phrases like an organism like a flock of birds or something you know you just it was unbelievable fast forward to today i think i'm more excited about my job with the cleveland orchestra than i was in that at that point in time um it's just a phenomenal institution You've got incredible incredible colleagues and uh, i appreciate more and more and more just the, the the commitment and dedication of everyone on stage it's really crazy so practice really 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 hard you guys Getting a, getting a good job is worth it, and an orchestra job, a good one, is awesome. It really is. It, took, it takes us all around the world. We get to play in recordings. We get to, it's, it's, you know, and you pay all this money for camp, you know, and all of a sudden you're, you're able to actually support yourself doing something you love. That's a pretty amazing grace. That's a, an amazing grace. All right. Um, so I, let me just give you just like a, a shortened version of the of the answer to the question. Um, in Cleveland, we um, some orchestras have, have an open call where anybody can come and audition. Cleveland um, looks at resumes and invites a certain number of people. Everybody else is invited to send a recording, and so so we're able to sort of pare it down so the audition day isn't like um, some orchestras that have to do an or audition day that lasts a whole week. Um, so it, it just, it's a different process. So whenever I auditioned at Cleveland, it was fairly streamlined and like there were 30, 40 players that played, um, and there was only two rounds. So it was like a, uh, first round, six of us went through and then, then like we played and, and they actually hired two people that day, myself and, um, uh, Paul, who was a, uh, still a colleague of mine in the cello section. Um, so just one word about auditions in general um you can tell as now that i've been on the other side and listened to auditions you can tell very very quickly um how a person plays it takes 30 seconds maybe um before you know how somebody plays so um you know we let people play you know you know their whole um set that they have to do for whatever round but um you make a judgment very quickly um, about pitch rhythm sound all those things um, and just a quick story, my first audition um, was for, I'll say, an unnamed orchestra. And it was one of those situations where they had an open call. And so it was like a lot of people, and I played at the very end of the day. I, I got passed through to the next round. They had semifinal round, um, and that started around 7.30 in the evening. And so there were like 20 of us in the semifinal round. So like, so we didn't start until 7.30. So it went to like around 10 o'clock. Then they had the final round, they passed it on and it was 10 of us in the final round. And it started after 10 o'clock. And we, I think I played before midnight and some people played like one o'clock, something like that. And then we sat around and waited for like hours. Um, and so it was, it was the opposite of that experience in Cleveland because it was very, um relatively quick and you you make your decision and, and and go for it um and so so it was so to give you a, a sense of the audition process but it's a very unnerving it's a, it's a very weird experience because you're playing this orchestra music without the orchestra and you're playing even a concerto or, or bach or something all by yourself it's a very strange experience and so my piece of advice would be to 
um, play it as many times as you can for other people so you get used to that experience. Because if the first time you've, you've had sort of a run through is, is at the audition, it's probably not gonna go very well. So like everything else, you sort of have to practice it. So practice performing um, on these auditions and, and with these run throughs, they were very, very helpful. Um, so hopefully that helps with the audition process. But um, uh, one, somebody gave me a piece of advice to, um, uh, as a Christian with auditions, and they, they said they pray for the people. There's going to be a list of people on all the auditions. So like you play at 9 o'clock, next person plays at 9, 10. So you'll see a list of people. And, and they say they pray for all those people um, on the list before them. And it's a great way to sort of take your mind off of the stress of what you're going to do and give the audition to God. And I think that was a great piece of advice. No, well, that's really wonderful. I'll, I'm going to keep that in mind <laughs> myself. <laughs> um, great. So since we have a, less than 10 minutes, does anyone, before we ask, I ask any other questions that I had, um, does anyone listening, do you, any of you have any questions that you want to type in the chat here? I can read them off to them. Maybe give it a minute or so if anyone's been thinking of any over the past hour or so. Well, I think keep that in mind was and we can maybe we could get in one or two by the end of by the end of our chat. Um, so another question for our, our clean orchestra members. Um, is there anything you wish you could have told your high school or college self that you realize now you look back and we're like, oh, I wish I could have told myself that, you know, maybe it was if it was going into college or, or in graduate or waiting high school, something like that, that, that you look and wish you could have told yourself that, that for, for your future. Let's go bottom up on this one. Ellen? Yeah. <laughs> You have to unmute that high, high school self, high school self. Um, I, I saw somebody like on Facebook, they posted like something similar. It was like three words that you would tell your 18 year old self. Um, and some people put like um, buy Apple stock. That was one of them that I saw that was probably good advice. Um, but I would say just to like um, trust God you know, trust, trust God, because it's just, um, it's just so hard. It's, it's very stressful. Being, being in music is very stressful. Um, and um, just uh, one thing that I thought of whenever Jessica was speaking earlier um, about like the difficulty that we, that we all have um, and, and that, how that's when we learn, it's similar. You know, if you've listened to um, pieces, your favorite parts in most pieces are usually the most dissonant. And it's those moments where the harmonies clash that we really feel the emotion and we really connect to the music. And I think that would be a sort of a, a something maybe I would tell my 18 year old self is to in to whenever I get to those moments to not enjoy it because you're never going to enjoy it, but just be open, be still and, and know that, that, that he is God. Stanley, what do you think? It's a good, good question. <laughs> it's uh, when I was in high school, it was such a such a whirlwind, and I'm thinking of, of teachers and excitement and fun things and um, and music. Um, I think one thing that comes to mind, and this is a funny thing to say, at, with me actually becoming a musician, is. Uh, never close the door on an opportunity so there might be an opportunity to do something different in your life and sometimes we get locked into a path and uh, and it feels like it would be a failure to, to drop it and go on to something else but um, certainly in scripture and in many many people that I know if people have changed direction midlife or even in high school, um, it's not a failure. My son was a music or audio engineer major for three years at CIM. He's now a theology major. 
um, I asked him how he's doing, and he sent me a picture of all the books he's reading. He's going to be a theology and philosophy major, a double major. He says, I'm absolutely in heaven. This is really my happy place. Now, there was enormous pressure to, to, to change gears was basically in the conservatory mindset would have been an admission of failure. Not at all. It all contributed to God's plan. And so I guess to not go too long, yield, yield to God at every juncture in faith, even if it means doing something different. To kind of um, piggyback on what um, Stan was saying, I think one of the biggest things I would tell myself at that time and now still would be to give up control, um, stop trying to control everything. Um, and I mean that in a couple specific ways. Um, the first way, first way to give up control is to not think of, that you can direct how your life is going to go because you can't. You should let, let God take you where he's going to take you. And um, some ways I think it manifests itself is um, in preparing for different things. So every opportunity that comes your way, you should do it as if God asked you to do it. Um, so prepare. It, it could be a little thing. It could be a huge thing. You don't, you never know who's going to be there. You never know who's listening. You never know who you're going to meet. And who are you to judge what kind of opportunity God has sent you, you know? And so I missed a lot of, I, 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 I was trying to control a lot of things in my life. And I think I missed out on a lot of, you know, opportunities that God sent me because I was like, oh, well, you know, this one is more important than that. No, it really, I, I would just remember that God sends you every single thing. The second way is in a very practical thing, in practicing. Because I feel like, and I've worked with uh, students for many years now, and I feel that um, when bad practicing happens, um, sometimes we think, oh, I'm not doing a good job, I'm not paying attention. It, yes, that's part of the reason. But another reason that bad practicing happens is because we're trying to control what we sound like. So I see and hear a lot of students passing over things or glossing over slides for shifts, for instance, for string players, because you just want it to get, you just want to get there and, oh, see, I got the right note, right? But actually, if you're doing the process correctly and let yourself get to the wrong note, but do the process correctly, then you're giving up control of being like, oh, I did it right. You're like, okay, I, do, I got that wrong, but let me do it again the right way. And um, I, I see that so much in practice. And I feel like when I don't practice correctly, it's because I want my practicing to go well. You know, I want it to sound good. And if you just let go of control, let yourself be who you are at that moment, and then work with what you are, then you're going to improve the most. So. That's so true. Um, so to wrap up, we actually do have one question um, from Solomon. And his question is, um, when you were preparing for your Cleveland Orchestra auditions, how did you keep yourselves in check with your practicing? And he said, for example, one day you might feel all tired, um, and then you're trying to determine you know, whether you practice another hour or do you take you know, a nap, rest. Um, so how do you get past that, stay consistent, and go for the gold? I guess anyone can really jump in on that. Well, oh, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, since you said anyone, uh, I like the, uh, what... Uh, <laughs> that was a mistake. I should have watched my wording there. <laughs> I was saying about, about exercise and that you exercise, you damage the muscles, then you rest. So, I mean, recognize the importance of rest is, is something that, that is important. I mean, that, you know, I don't, didn't want to jump in, but I didn't want to miss that point. So. Thank you, Pisa. <laughs> there was, um, there's a writer that I was like listening to, like a podcast, and um, he was saying, um, 
see if I can get it get it right, but he, it was something like, um, I, I, I wait for inspiration, wait for inspiration like every day at nine o'clock whenever I sit at the typewriter or something like that. And so his point was like this, the, the dedication, the discipline to sort of um, open up your case in, in, our, in, in our situation, open up your case, rosin your bow and start playing um, is, is sometimes the hardest part. And so like just that discipline, um, I remember there was this one guy um, that I went to school with and um, he was, he was talented, but he wasn't the most talented um, guy in, in the studio, but man, that guy worked. And like every morning um, he would do the scale routine. It would drive us crazy because like, he, you know, the walls at CIM are, are pretty thin and he would practice in his dorm room. And so like, it was like 7.30 or something. Every, every, um, every morning he would do the scale routine and it would take him like 30, 40 minutes. And so like, it would just be killing us because you know, we were, I was a little bit older. I was in masters at that point. So like, I was like sleeping in a little bit and starting my practice. I was a, a late night practicer, but, um, but this guy, he was an early morning guy and he was so disciplined. He did it every day. And like I said, he was not the most talented, but the guy's got a job um, right now. Um, and so like that discipline, that, that steadiness will take you a long way. It takes talent. Yes. But it takes uh, a lot of work as well. I would just add to what Pete, uh, Mr. Slowick said, and that was uh, uh, the tiny little story is that I was my freshman year, I was really struggling to prepare for my lessons. And, um, and I want to know what's going on with Audrey and Sir down there. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and so uh, Mr. Vernon was trying to get me to get my time organized, which I wasn't the most organized in my time, especially at that point. And uh, uh, I came across, you know, the idea of one day of rest. So I did that, and that was a Sunday. And, of course, the day I announced that I wasn't going to have rehearsals on Sunday, my string quartet members were like, well, we have to because we have a coaching on Monday. We have to, to do it the day before. I said, go ahead, you know, just start without me. And, uh, and uh, anyway, it was kind of funny. But... From that point on, having that one day of true leisure, you know, where I read, I prayed, I went to church, I did all these things that allowed me to recoup and um, recharge, real true recreation. Um, that was magical. And all it was was following God's plan. I didn't make it up. So... That would be my addition to that question. Um, I have um, one practical suggestion and one kind of more kind of spiritual, kind of um, bigger kind of um, piece of advice. So the practical piece of advice would be to just keep it small, be really organized, um, try, kind of map out your excerpts. So what I like to do, what I did for this audition, when I auditioned here, I split the excerpts into two groups and one concerto on one day, one concerto on another day. And you give yourself little time slots. Say, I'm gonna work on this for 20 minutes today. I'm gonna to work on that. And then each excerpt gets a certain amount of time. If you kind of have that roadmap, it makes it easier for you to just start because you, know, you have some kind of outline to your day. That really helped me. I'm not the world's most devoted practicer myself. And I, I've struggled a lot with, you know, staying um, kind of consistent with practice. But I did not so much now, but I, when I was younger um, and even in school, I had a hard time with it. And so doing that really helped, you know, me personally, just like keep it simple. And if you don't feel like you can practice a lot that day, you're just like not feeling it, but feel like you need to do something, just say to yourself, okay, I'm going to do 30 minutes, even that you can get a lot done in that. And it doesn't feel as daunting on those days when you don't really feel like it. Second thing is when, if you notice a pattern in not wanting to practice or just kind of feeling, like, oh, just, I don't feel like practicing. I'm not into it. You know, I just gotta make my, if you feel yourself needing to make yourself practice a lot, I would pray about it and also ask yourself the question, why is this? Is it, the, and usually it's from fear. 
I found it's usually from fear because you're afraid you just, it's too much work to get where you want to get. Um, it's too much. You're just afraid of what you're going to hear. Um, you're afraid that um, you're not going to sound good enough and that you never will improve. Um, so um, I find that that's usually the number one reason why we continually avoid practicing or find it to be a chore. So then I would pray about that um, and just pray that God help you through that and, and help you learn more about yourself as a player um, through, through that. And you know, feel free to, you should reach out to your mentors and ask them for help at those times. You don't need to do it by yourself. All great advice. Um, well, if anyone doesn't have any other questions, um, thank you all for joining us tonight. This was wonderful. Thank you to our Cleveland Orchestra members for all their wonderful words of advice. And um, this was really wonderful. Um, uh, just a last little plug. If you haven't already joined the Credo Club Facebook group, please do. Um, and oh, Peace on one, it's a lightning round. All right, we'll do a quick lightning round. Real, real quick. Um, let me see, I have my lightning round questions. And then also subscribe to the YouTube channel as well because a lot of the content will be getting on that. But okay, is everyone ready? Um, if you could buy any type of food right now in this moment, order food right now, what would it be? Do we do this on chat or do we just answer? You can, I think you just answer, right? Your, your panel is unmute, just blur it yeah, out. Yeah, you just blur it, just sushi, sushi, sushi. Sushi, <laughs> sushi. Indian food. Oh, yeah. Um, favorite pizza or pizza topping? Giordano's deep dish. Oh, yes. Sardines. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, oh, what favorite Beethoven symphony? Good question. That's a good question. Three. Seven. Oh, okay. Um, a post staccato, yes or no? <laughs> Meaning, can you do it or do you like it? No, do you like it? <laughs> oh, good with it. All I need is an audience. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, that's a difficult one. Favorite animal and, and favorite, oh, someone asked favorite recording. What's your favorite? It could be anything, I guess, whether it's orchestral mm -hmm. or solo or. Joseph Sigetti's mm -hmm. recording of Prokofiev first violin concerto. That is major. the best recording ever. That is so good. Rubenstein, Chopin, Nocturnes. It's actually a live, it's not a recording. I mean, it's a recording. It was a live performance of the Grosse Fugue by the Cleveland Orchestra in London. I wore the cassette tape broadcast out because it was just crazy. Uh, favorite viola joke? This is, this is, this is a good one. Mr. Kanaka, do you have any favorite viola jokes? Yeah, everyone, knows, everyone knows it though. How do you know the stage is level? I've never heard this one. How? When the drooling is coming out of both sides of the viola's mouth. <laughs> so I think only violas can answer this. Uh, why are viola jokes so short? So the conductors can understand them. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, oh, what was each of your most memorable concerts? Mm. Leon Fleischer doing the complete Brahms waltzes shortly after he came back to playing with two hands. We played the Messian um, Tarangalila Symphony, my first time playing that, and I pretty much, my brain exploded. It was just unbelievable. Yeah, I asked Franz if that was the greatest piece in the 20th century. He says, yeah, probably, pretty much. Uh, we did, it's not one concert, but we did all the Beethoven symphonies in, in Vienna and here in Cleveland and um, Tokyo. That was a great tour. Uh, what was your scariest performance? Lynn and Bob didn't show up and I had a page and a half uh, solo. 
So I had practiced it, but I thought for sure that I was covered, and I wasn't. So all of a sudden, I had to play solo, and that was soon after I got assistant principals. I have a feeling it was staged. I was afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, that is quite terrifying. Um, anyone else have any I was playing traumatic performances? Yeah, I was playing a new concerto, um, and I, I prepared it pretty well, but not, I guess not well enough. So I get out on stage and they start playing the opening and I could not remember how it started. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my gosh, oh my God. I couldn't even remember which note it started on. And I was like, well, God, you're just gonna bring me in. And somehow like it was time to come in and I just started and it, it went, but I was freaking out the whole concert. <laughs> it's like my worst nightmare. I did this. Um, I, I played Rococo at this orchestra in China and um, I was jet lagged um, and like I tripped over my cello in like the dress rehearsal and like it, it like got stuck, the peg got stuck on my, my shoe um, loop and so like I went down and the cello went down and it was cracked and so like so I had to play the concerto the next day and um, it was like, so the cello, it was, it was like cracked and I didn't, it was either that or play somebody else's instrument and um, there weren't really any good instruments. So like I just decided to play on it and do, do the best I could. And like, I remember um, in the, um, there, in the introduction to the, to the Rococo, there's this like beautiful horn solo. And I, I had played the whole thing in a dress rehearsal and it went really well. And I was like really happy. And it was like late in the day, I was jet lagged. And so I heard this horn solo and I was like, I closed my eyes and I was like, I'm on stage at this point, this is the concert. And I was, I'm like, I could go to sleep right now. And, <laughs> fine. and so that was probably my scariest, wasn't my best for Rococo. Oh man. All right, last question. Favorite concerto not played by your own instrument? Are there any? Shallow <laughs> concertos are the only concertos that yeah, let's see. exist. <laughs> Is that why Yo-Yo Ma plays the Bartok viola concerto? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the Brahm. It's, it's sort of a sort of a cello concerto, you know, the, um, the Brahms suck up piano concerto. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Jessica mentioned Leon Fleischer. He recorded that with Cleveland and it, um, it's got this big cello solo and it is so beautiful. It's so great. That's probably one of my favorite recordings too. Brahms suck up piano concerto. Brahms violin concerto. I really love Beethoven fourth piano concerto. Mm. Definitely an underrated concerto, I, I yeah. Say. yeah. Yeah, good, true. Oh, awesome. Well, again, thank you, everyone. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say this is uh, great, the, yeah. the spirit of, of bringing music and, and, and great, great classical musicians of, of depth together. It's just such a rewarding thing. And thanks for, thanks to uh, Stan and Jessica and Alan for really nourishing us tonight and inspiring us. Uh, we'll be doing this every month until we run out of friends. Um, so if you know people who should be on these panels, uh, let us know, um, because, uh, we want to keep this going every month and, uh, we'll be adding things, but, uh, join up for Credo Club, share this with your friends uh, or people that need it, you know, <laughs> um, blessings to you and, uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you everyone. Thank you.